While it's been good for us to wander virtually together across the battlefields of the Great War, one of the things that I wanted to do from the very beginning was to make recordings on the ground itself. So after these long months of lockdown, I finally had a chance to get back to the battlefields. And I'm pleased to present this episode recorded in Flanders a few weeks ago. This was a new experience for me, and there were the usual hiccups with technology, so bear with the sound on this one, it will get better. But now it's time for us to return to the old front line. After several months away from the Western Front, feeling probably more than a little bit cut off from it, it's quite good to to be back here, to be walking down this grass path now towards one of the more than 170 British and Commonwealth cemeteries that surround the city of Ypres. Here was Britain's bastion on the Western Front. Four years of war, a quarter of a million men died in defence of Ypres. And cemeteries like this one, Bleuet Farm, commemorate the men who fell here in that period. This is a small cemetery behind the lines close to the medical facilities that were in this area from 1915 until the end of the war and the vast majority of the men buried in here are known because these men were brought in wounded, died of their wounds so they know who they were and they were buried or they were men killed in the front line who were brought back here for burial by their comrades away from the battlefield area where burials were difficult. When you come into cemeteries like this, you can't help but read them. You can't help but look to see what it is they tell you as you walk in. And as you wander along the graves, the rows of graves here at Blue A Farm, you see that the dates are almost entirely between July and November of 1917. So this is very much a third Battle of Ypres, Battle of Passchendaele Cemetery. In the far corner, you spot a squared off headstone. And when you come to walk over to it, you discover it's the grave of a German aviator, Karl Voss. I don't know whether he's a relation of Werner Voss, one of the famous German aces of the Great War. This chap flew with the German Marine Corps Flying Service and he was shot down here on the 17th of December 1917. Like all these cemeteries, the little time capsules of the Great War, they're an insight into the men that, uh, that served here. They reflect the units that passed through this part of the Western Front. There's a lot of men from the Guards Division in here. I can see cap badges of the Grenadier Guards, the Irish Guards, and the Scots Guards, some cold streamers. So it reflects the important role that division had in the Third Battle of Ypres, particularly in the opening phase close to the village of Bozinger, which is just across the fields from where this cemetery is located. And because there are very few unknown soldiers in here, as you wander along you read the inscriptions. Inscriptions on these headstones fascinate people, and they, I'm sure, will continue to fascinate people for many, many years to come. But being back here, it's great to be amongst these, these little lines that were penned to remember these men, to recall who they were, what they meant to someone, to ponder on the value of sacrifice. And here I am at Guardsman Cobb's grave, who died on the 15th of July, 1917. His family said, he was too young to fight and too young to die. He was age 17. Other inscriptions refer to battles. I'm standing at the grave of Lieutenant Brian John Dunlop of the Grenadier Guards, who died on the first day of the Third Battle of Ypres, 31st of July 1917, age 19. He was from uh, Early in Berkshire, and it says he was killed at the Battle of the Pilcombe Ridge in Flanders. There are gunners here because this ground, these flat fields around the cemetery, were used by both the field artillery, divisional level artillery support and the Royal Garrison artillery, the heavy guns, this huge bombardment that took place in the lead up to the Third Battle of Ypres. And this is our first stop on these few days here back on the old front line. I'm here with 
fellow Battlefield guides, Tim Thurlow, Mark Allen. And no matter how many times you visit a cemetery, I, I've been to this one a few times with relatives of men buried in here on Ledger Battlefield tours, brought them to visit a loved one's grave. So I've been here a few times and you always, always you find something new. And we've come across the graves of several men from the South African Railway Overseas Dominion section. Something that, a unit that I certainly had not come across myself before. And it makes sense because when you look at the trench maps around this cemetery, there are full of railway lines. There are light railways, some heavier railways put down as the battle moved forward. These were the lifelines to the front, both of the troops going forward, the wounded coming back, and the eternal route of supply, because without the bullets and bayonets and bombs, the war could not continue, and the railways got them there. So above me is a skylark singing above these graves, above the trees of Blue A Farm Cemetery, casting out its song across the flat fields of Flanders, and in the distance, I can see the spires of Ypres. And beyond that, the front line. The old front line. It's early morning on the old front line, and I'm in the garden of the cottage where we're staying, which is on the site of the German front line for almost two years during the Great War from mid-1915 until the opening of the Third Battle of Ypres, the Battle of Passchendaele, in 1917. And in the distance, with a bit of cloud behind it, are the spires of Ypres, the tall spire of St Martin's Cathedral, the clock tower of the Cloth Hall, and the smaller spire of St Jack's, which is close to where the Menin Gate is in Ypres. Beyond that, I can see the turbines of the wind farm just north of Ypres, close to the village of Bozinger along the Issa Canal, the northern part of the old Ypres salient. And in my mind's eye I can follow the line round and across the trees I can see to my right the Belloir Ridge and Railway Wood. To my left is the Menin Road and Hoog. Beyond that Sanctuary Wood, Mount Sorrel, Hill 62 and eventually the Messines Ridge. Here was the Great War. Here was once a wasteland of craters that the battlefields recovered and around me are the sound of birds. Chiff chaff singing in the trees behind me and a wren posed on the wire of the fence close to where during the war the German wire would have been. And it brings to mind those stories of the veterans that I knew who remembered seeing birds on barbed wire in front of their positions bringing to mind the more normal life that it had left behind in dear old Blighty. But a familiar ring of home that gave them some hope, some consolation in places like this. Birds in the wire. That's why I often talk about the wildlife here and the birds on the battlefields and bring those sounds into this podcast. It's an essential part of this landscape today, just as it was then. In the distance, the rumble of the modern world. But around us, the silent fields, but not so silent really. It's that connection that we have to the Great War that brings us to places like this, makes them what they are. And will always do so, I suspect. So later today, we'll be out on the battlefields themselves, the cemeteries and the memorials and walking the ground for now. A quiet time amongst the birds, looking out over the old front line.
During these long months of lockdown, your mind goes back to the things that you've done, and particularly when I think about my travels across the battlefields of the Great War. I've been thinking about some of the visits that I've made to cemeteries, the silent cities, over the years, and I've come to Porteza Chateau Lawn Cemetery, and on my very first Ledger battlefield tour, 23 years ago now, I had a chap sitting behind me on the coach uh, who tapped me on the shoulder and he said, do we go to Porteza Cemetery as, as part of this tour? And I said, well, no, we don't. I said, but it's not too difficult to go there. What's your interest in, in going to that cemetery? And he said, well, my father's buried there. And of course, I said to him, well, we're, we're going, you know, uh, under any and every circumstance, we are going. So we came here and I pulled the coach up out on the front by the road and the gravel path that I've just walked down, um, we came down that together, kept the group back on the coach so he could make a private visit. And we came in. Now, this is in the pre-internet days when you just couldn't look up a casual to see where they were buried. And I said, well, I'll check in the register. And he just peeled off and he walked straight to his father's grave. So after he paid his respects and had a little private time on his own, I walked over to see if he was OK. And I said to him, that, that was just incredible. You know, you've just walked straight to your dad's grave. He said, well, I, I have been here before. I came here as a young boy when this was just wooden crosses and something just, it was a compulsion just to walk to where my dad was and, and here he is. So I've done that today. Part of my link to the past and that generation now almost past whose dads were killed in this war, I've come here to Porteza to see his grave. So walking now into the cemetery, I've peeled off just like he did all those years ago, and I'm walking past the main plots. It's quite a mix of regiments in here because Porteza Chateau, the ruins of which were demolished after the war, and there's no trace of it today, it was just across the fields behind us here, and it was used as a dressing station at various points in the fighting. General Snow had had his headquarters there in 1915, and I remember in his diaries he records watching the huge German shells coming from the Hutholz forest fly like express trains in the sky over the battlefield and strike the walls of the Cloth Hall or St Martin's Cathedral, which he could see behind him in the distance. But later in the war, like I say, it was used as a dressing station, and many of the men buried here died of their wounds. Some were killed up in the front line, um, brought back here for burial. And I've walked across to the grave of that man's father, and it's an unusual grave because he served with the machine gun corps, and their cap badge is normally in a, a circle on the top of the headstone. But this is a large cross with the machine gun corps badge set in the centre. Probably replicates the sort of original wooden grave marker that was on this spot. And I think back over those years, and the son of this soldier, John Henwick Simpson, who died just after the end of the Battle of Passchendaele on the 22nd of November 1917, what that must have meant to him to stand here at that grave, having last seen it as that wooden cross. And as I stand here, I wonder what he must have thought when he came here, having last seen it as a boy, to see his dad's name on that Portland stone for his father, a degree of immortality. No doubt he remembered his father's face. But he told me how his father had spent a lot of time in Flanders during the Great War, and he got friendly with a family in Popperinger who'd originally lived in Ypres. They'd run a tea shop in the main square, and then after the war, they'd opened it again. And when he came over with his mother to visit his dad's grave in the 1920s, that family had put them up and brought them out to Porteza Cemetery and told them that the death of Private Simpson had broken their heart just as if he was their own son. And perhaps at times we forget the, that soldiers didn't just have links back to their families at home, they had links to people here, just as, just as us, as we visit. We have links, we get to know people here in Belgium, or down on the Somme or in northern France, and those links are important. They forge connections to those who live and spend most of their lives here on the battlefields, and we can learn so much from them as well. But it certainly is a reflective moment to come here and think of that nearly quarter of a century, for me, of working as a guide for Ledger, bringing probably thousands of people to visit cemeteries like this to pay their respects for a loved one. The days are gone when it's children looking for fathers. It's now 
grandchildren or great-grandchildren. But that connection is so strong, and I don't think we'll ever fade away. And as we stand in these silent cities and look along the rows and read the names, Cassidy, Proven, Smith, Roberts, Dawson, these are the men who made history more than a century ago. We come here and we look and we connect. And the past doesn't seem so far away somehow. We've come across the battlefields at Ypres now to Polkapel British Cemetery. It's the third largest British and Commonwealth cemetery in Belgium. Tynecott being the biggest of all, then Lissenhoek and then Polkapel. There's seven and a half thousand burials here. And I'm sitting in a shelter at the rear of the cemetery, just as the sun is catching the top of the headstones. And some of the flowers are moving gently in the breeze. And there's a lot of swallows here at the moment, and they're darting over the cemetery, catching the insects in the warm breeze. And when you wander around the rows and rows that disappear off to the far side of the cemetery towards the Cross of Sacrifice, you see that the vast majority of the men buried here have not been identified. So of that 7,500 graves, only just over 1,200 are known. Thousands and thousands of men whose identities were lost. And this is typical of this part of the battlefield. It's, it's one of the few British cemeteries in this area. There is the vast burial ground at Tyne Cots. There's Passchendaele New British Cemetery. But up towards Langemark and here around Polkapel, in the area where the Third Battle of Ypres came to a conclusion in September, October and November of 1917, there aren't the small battlefield cemeteries. They were closed and concentrated into this site. So it reflects that 1917 period and reflects that battle in the mud that we've spoken about in previous podcasts where men disappeared along with everything else, horses, guns, wagons, tanks, drawn into that sucking deep Belgian mud that characterised so much of that 1917 fighting. A liquid landscape. If you came off the tracks, if you came off the corduroy roads, you were lost forever. And here is a cemetery dominated by unknown burials, sometimes partly identified, a rank, a regiment, a year, a date of burial, but not enough, just not enough detail to ascertain who that was. The vast legion of unknown soldiers, which a hundred years ago were brought together to a high altar for the burial of the unknown warrior in Westminster Abbey, but here they're legion. When I look at the headstones of so many unknown soldiers in cemeteries like this, I think of the thousands of portrait photographs that I have in which there are no names on the back. Unknown soldiers of a different type, perhaps some of them buried here, or in the many other cemeteries that I've visited over the years. And I suppose it's those are the faces that I see. These aren't just white stones, blank and anonymous. They are the sepulchre of the dead. And in them I see the faces of those men. And whoever they were, at least for a little time, they come alive again and are forever in perpetuity with the work that's done here, the magnificent work by the Commonwealth War Graves Commission. And already we've seen some of their gardeners today who after months of lockdown and no visitors were quite pleased to see people coming back to the cemeteries. For a moment the traffic on the road between Polkapel and Staden has faded away. The sound of birds are above the cemetery. Nature's returned, reclaimed as it did, this part of the old front line. So it's the final morning and we're just getting ready to pack up and head back to Blighty. I'm looking out across from the garden here towards the spires of Ypres, up to our right, the Bellawada Ridge, and beyond it, the railway wood, the front lines, the old front lines of the Great War. It's been good to reconnect with these battlefields this week. They've seemed so far away, 
but they're so familiar to us as we walk this ground and we scan those names on the headstones and see the places so far removed from the modern world. There is something eternal about these battlefields, something that will always link us to this time and the men, the ordinary men who were here. So until we meet again, until we walk along those paths and beacons of the old front line, You've been listening to an episode of The Old Front Line with me, military historian Paul Reed. Do take time to subscribe to us via your favourite podcast service. Tell us what you think using the hashtag Old Front Line. You can follow me on Twitter at Somcor and the podcast has its own Twitter feed now at Old Front Line Pod and have a look at the podcast websites oldfrontline.co.uk Until we meet again along the Old Front Line.